So thank you, Andy. Andy is going to join our panel, so um, we'll have, all have the opportunity to ask Andy some questions and the rest of the panel uh, in a short while. But first, uh, I'd just like to uh, ask the panel members to come up to stage and take a seat. Um, and once you've taken a seat, perhaps you'd all like to introduce yourselves. You can be using Slido throughout this bit to uh, start asking your questions. <coughs> oh, um, Rob, would you like to start? Yes. Good evening. My name is Rob Bush. My background is that I was uh, running an ERDF project a couple of years ago for a project called SCORE, which was involved in offshore renewable energy. And within that, we did start to look at quite a bit of artificial intelligence, machine learning coming through uh, relating to the offshore wind energy. And now working at EGA, uh, we can see the mirrored effects coming through for oil and gas as well. I'm Andy Stanford Clark, you know who I am. Microphone, sorry. That's uh, hi, uh, my name is Rohit Chaturvedi, and I'm working with Tech Mahindra. Uh, I'm uh, heading their retail center of excellence. Here I'm working with the East of England Co-op. We are uh, leading a business transformation project for East of England Co-op. Uh, we are building a singular omni view of their all the data warehouse for their different line of businesses. And uh, going forward, we are going to leverage that for building insights and to optimize their business. So uh, I'm Ben Mean. Um, I work for North Care, which is an adult social care provider um, with care homes across Norfolk, um, providing care to about 1,500 um, older people. Um, I manage digital projects for the company, um, so probably slightly on the lower tech side of things compared to my other panel members, but um, interesting nonetheless, I hope. It can get a lot lower tech. <laughs> I'm Emma Griffin, and I'm the historian here at UVA on the panel. So one of the things I do um, that I've always been interested in is about the history of the Industrial Revolution. So that is a story really about new technology, um, uh, new, far, new ways of making things and doing things at work that displace the things that people were doing previously in a more labour-intensive way by hand. But that's not actually why I'm here. The reason I'm here is because I've also got involved as a historian in a large AI project that's based at the British Library and at the Turing Institute in London where we're trying to train computers to read historical documents. So normally historians just read the documents themselves. It's quite a small scale operation. But sometimes evidence and data was collected on a really massive scale that we can't do. So the, example, the ones that we're, we're working on are the newspaper archive from the 19th century. I mean, there are millions, millions and millions of pages of text that we just can't read individually. And the census, the Victorian census, again, we've got millions of data points that we can't as historians using traditional methods work. So uh, it's about really trying to use AI to start reading those documents and telling us something interesting about the past. Awesome. A lot more exciting than me. So look, I'm Owen Morris. I'm uh, Managing Director of Data Science at Aviva. Um, we have 700 data scientists globally in 14 different countries. Data science essentially sits right at the heart of financial services, insurance and investments. Uh, from home and motor insurance here in, in the UK to some of our big investment portfolios um, in various parts of the world. So look, it's a really big thing for us. We, we have our largest single centre here in Norwich with 270 data scientists here. Um, and we're a really big part of the city. And um, yeah, we love Norwich. Good. <laughs> if you want to join, you can ask me later. Very good. <laughs> So I'm Vittoria Danino. I work for Anglia Water. Um, I guess you probably know what we do. Um, we do a lot of stuff that is dangerous, dirty and dull. And, uh, and therefore, uh, in this space, we are really looking about how we can optimise our use of these types of technologies. Excellent. Well, um, so I'd, I'd like to start by asking each of you perhaps to give an example. I'm going to start with you, Vittoria. Um, of how AI is being implemented today, um, and actually, uh, Ben, if there isn't an example of AI being implemented in Norse, then you are welcome to see another technology. But how something's being implemented today, and what the sort of practical consequences of that are for your organisation? 
So a lot of our infrastructure uh, is underground. Uh, it's quite hard to get to. Um, we need to kind of monitor and sense it better than we do. Um, but I guess one of the things that we've been using quite recently, um, well, the Beast from the East um, last year, we suddenly had a massive uh, impact on our infrastructure. And we needed to kind of find out how we optimized um, what engineers went out where to give the biggest benefit to our customers. We had fewest people off water. We had the least amount of leaks um, that we could possibly manage. And that, for our business, was one of the first times we've been able to use AI in a very quick way. So um, I'm not an AI expert, um, but the guys who are um, up in Lincoln said, you know, they hacked that in, in three days, um, sitting in uh, the incident room within the company. And it's those kind of things about how we do use that technology to make sure we've got the right people in the right place, um, preferably before we have a leak. Um, we're probably not quite there yet. We go next, right. Um, so we, we've built some AI that reads medical reports, but Andy's already described some of that. So let me give you another example. Um, we observed that our customers, um, if you go onto one of these big price comparison websites in the UK, you'd answer about 100 <coughs> questions to buy a home insurance policy, which is quite a lot of effort. And it left our customers feeling pretty uncertain. Sometimes they'd filled them out correctly. It took a long time. A lot of people didn't bother. Um, so we thought, actually, if you're already one of our customers, can we create uh, a, pr a premium for you that you can just come in and buy? A bit like me when I buy a shirt. I hate um, shopping, so I won't walk past a shirt shop straight away. You have my size in a bag, and I can just go in and pay. Great, I, w I want that. So can we create that simplicity? And obviously, insurance is about predicting risks, so you can't simply get rid of the questions because you'll be out of business in about five minutes flat. Um, so data science was the answer. Um, and so rather than asking 100 questions, we assembled tens of thousands of data points, including a database covering all 23 and a half million properties in the UK. Uh, people asking, is there a river within 400 meters of your house when you've got Google Maps and various other mapping software that you can find things? There were impossible questions that we answered. Um, we actually had mapped out the height of the land in the UK to within about 50 centimeters. We've got big teams of people mapping floods and all sorts of things. We actually observed that we could work out if roofs were sloped or flat, yeah? Sloped roofs are good for insurance, flat roofs are, are not so good, they leak, um, or at least did when we did the modeling. Um, and we could actually work that out for customers rather than asking them questions that were almost impossible to answer if you're sitting there on your phone. So yeah, it's making a real difference to us, um, both, both us as a company, but more importantly, to making things easy for our customers. Okay, so um, my, the, the bulk of my job is working as an academic inside a history department, um, and that's a job with many, many different facets, and the vast majority of what I do is not going to be affected none of my colleagues here at UEA and in every other history department, and many other humanities departments are not going to be affected by AI, because a lot of what we're doing is teaching, um, and it's all about personal relationships, and we're not really at a stage where we think that um, that kind of teaching relationship, even the marking of work, which we would, I think we would love to palm off to computers, we're just nowhere near a world <laughs> where, we can, um, where we're replaceable <laughs> by anything that computers are doing. Um, and likewise, a lot of historical research is all about reading documents, and documents are often really um, unstable, and they're open to multiple interpretations, and often there aren't that many of them, so you don't need computers because you're not dealing with a massive data set. So mostly what I'm working on is um, working class autobiographies. And they're just really dodgy narratives in lots of ways. I mean, somebody will say, oh, my daddy was the best dad ever. And then they'll go on, except when he was drunk, which he did an awful lot, and then it was very scary. And then they carry on and say, but apart from that, he was a great dad. And you've got these kind of stories that wobble around, and they're not kind of clear and consistent. And, and the interpretation of these documents and what we're doing in humanities department is really interpreting documents and it's a human skill and not something that we can envisage for the moment being done by computer more efficiently or effectively or reliably than we can do it. Though we know we do it very unreliably as well, but that's not a question. But there is this specific case where sometimes they say there's so much data, there's just more data than the human brain can, um, can, can really handle. And the census is a really good example of that. We just have so much information about the size and structure of the economy and of the population and how many, how many children people were living in their households with, when children were in school, when they started work, what kind of jobs men were doing, uh, whether women were working, whether it 
affected whether they were married or unmarried or the size of their families as to whether... I mean, just, just, there's just masses of information in there. But because it's a population of 20 million, rising to 30, rising to 40 million, and we're taking these census every 10 years, it's just way more data than the human brain can, can, can cope with. So there are very, very specific examples where we think um, computing can be trained on fairly simple data sets, and we, that, that's what my project is all about, is it's kind of exploring that possibility. Um, but that's within a sea of many, many other responsibilities <coughs> that we don't really see um, AI being um, useful for at the moment. So um, our application of AI, again, is, is fairly low tech, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. Um, and that's the Amazon Echo devices. Um, so a while ago, we ran a little um, pilot project putting a couple of these Amazon Echoes in some of our um, communal spaces and some of our care homes. And initially, we were a bit skeptical about how much that would be uptaken. Traditionally, the view of older people is that they don't like to engage with technology. So we thought, well, it's probably not going to be too successful. But what we found was really interesting. And I think what we found is that input technologies are what stop older people using technology. Um, so if they have to use a tablet and they have to use a touch, or if they have to use a mouse and keyboard, that's the thing that scares them alongside the fear of breaking the technology. So we found that when we put natural language recognition in there, and as that improved over time to the point where people could have natural conversations with it, that was really powerful, because that then brought a whole new generation of people um, access to services like Spotify. And what we're finding is that's really powerful for reminiscence activities. So especially um, within dementia, we talk about capturing the moment. And what that means is that people with dementia often have small periods of clarity where they're um, talking about moments in their past, music they like to listen to, um, artists perhaps that they like. And um, we like to make the most of those moments by playing some music, having a conversation with them about that. But what we were finding with, was that carers would then have to go and find a CD. So they'd have to find a CD of that artist put it on, and by the time they'd come back, they'd lost that moment with the resident with dementia. Whereas now that we've got these speakers in all of our care homes, they can just have a natural conversation with the resident, they can talk to the speaker, they can play some music that's relevant to that conversation, and they can have a really um, interesting reminiscence session with them and keep that conversation going. And it's now moved to a stage further than that, when rather than the carer um, directing those experiences, residents are starting to control it themselves. They're feeling more confident with the technology because they get immediate feedback that um, there's a problem. They can tell it to stop if it's doing something they don't want it to do. And that means that they can start their own activities. They can start asking themselves what music they want to listen to and start conversations between the resident groups about whether they like their taste in music or not. And we're finding really interesting stuff about our residents that we never thought in the first place. Things like um, residents that are over 80 that um, like listening to the prodigy Never in a million years <laughs> do we think that, that someone would listen to Smack My Bitch Up in one of our cares. <laughs> <laughs> it's throwing the wall back out the window, and we're finding things about our residents that we never thought were possible. <laughs> good, good mention for the prodigy there. Yeah. R.I.P. Keith Flint, by the way. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. it's a funeral tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> right here. Let's get yeah. So, yeah, from the retail, so I'll talk about the retail perspective uh, predominantly. And in terms of AI, we talk about, and if I classify our retail customer shopping journey into broadly four phases, which is like attract, engage, convert, and retain. AI is coming handy in all four phases. It is because everybody's customer here, so you can easily relate what I'm talking to. Uh, the, all the phases where you, you start engaging with your, or your, your idea came into your mind where you want to shop something. Typically, you, you pick up your mobile if you, if you are a new age customer, or you just ask your friend. Typically, that is how you start with things. So that when, you are, when you are picking your mobile and you are putting those search words or keywords in that, based on your input, what you are driving in, you will get the related search results into that. Now, this is what the AI, which is basically at the back end helping you out to get you the right result, what you are looking at, and what, what you find out. Now, the second moment when you, when you start tracking it or when you get the right details, you want to go ahead and see what, how you can buy those things. So directing you to the physical store or to the website or to the mobile channel. It is all AI which is basically give, giving all those links. So you, you as a user, you are using every day. Might be you're not realizing that everything is basically enabled by the AI thing, which is happening at the back end. And then once you reach to your mobile site or the website, basically those assisted shopping which is happening, the, the digital assistant which came into handy and helping you out to figure out your product because that is the most tedious task. If you see in online uh, shopping, 
3% is the conversion rate as of now. Out of 100 people who are coming on the website, only 3% buy, buy the product. So just browse, create, your, create the cart and just left it. Left it because either they are not finding their product or they want to evaluate more options to be in. But with the help of AI, the assisted chat, which uh, chat agent which is coming in digital, they are helping you out to find the right product. They are helping you out to give you right promotions and offers and helping you to convert your sales, which you are just looking at to finish your uh, sales. Even when you are converting your sales to retain your, because the, the largest challenge or the biggest, one of the biggest challenges to retain your customer or to get your customer back on the website. Right now, people are not so brand conscious. They are typically on the experience side and the cost conscious, so it's something which is coming handy. Now, AI is coming there also because they know what you bought it, what kind of need you are generating. They are connecting all the dots at the back end and then giving you right promotions at the right time and giving you what recommendations, what other people are buying in. This is all enabled by AI. So being, being, a, being a consumer retail, if you see, AI is, helping hand, uh, AI is helping a lot to the consumer to make the experience great, in that sense. Uh, yeah, um, my example is it's not actually Red Sea Eager is a company that we work with at Eager, but they do um, subsea surveys on oil and gas and uh, wind platforms uh, using an ROV technology. Uh, nothing new there. However, what they've developed is a program and algorithm where the <laughs> ROV actually conducts the survey in a semi-automated response. So it knows the area it's looking at. It will go along and create a 3D tile thanks to some fancy stereoscopic 4K uh, cameras. It then reviews the data that's being collected. If it knows there's any holes, it'll actually go back along where it's been to recollect better quality or to fill in those gaps, then gets fed back um, onto the ship or back to the station, uh, back to the um, master control center. What they're developing now is also some visual recognition. So along subsea structures, these anodes, which are sacrificial bits of metal, you might see them on boats, the bits that look silver and heavily pitted. It stops the electrolysis, electrolysis sorry, and reduces the corrosion on uh, metal surf surfaces below the surface. This ROV can now go along, it can actually, it knows what an anode looks like, and it can actually go along, pick up the shape, identify the shape, circle it, and then actually say whether it needs replacing or if it's okay, and then it'll go along. From that, they're trying to look at habitat mapping. So they know they've got particular shapes of, say, coral structures or reef structures. So the, the ROV will collect that data, review it. If it looks okay, it's great, goes back. If it's something it doesn't know, it'll actually flag it up. And then so a scientist back over on the boat or somewhere else on shore can then review that data collected and identify it formally. The idea is it then speeds the process up, therefore reducing the cost of the entire survey process. So um, I'd just like to sort of take the temperature, perhaps, of, of each of the industries that you work in, because we've got a very diverse set of sectors and industries, of kind of how AI and automation are perceived today by workforce, by your colleagues, by, uh, and, and is that a kind of Positive, negative, a bit of both. Um, yeah, dive in. Yeah, please. So, yeah, pick it up on Andy's point. I think that the potential for artificial intelligence isn't necessarily to replace the human element. So, it's something care, the human element is really important. You can't have care without human interaction. And I think it's not about replacing the side of things that are interacting, interacting with residents, delivering personal care. It's about getting rid of the, the back-end paperwork, the bits that no one ever signs up to care to do paperwork. They want to interact with residents. They want to deliver care. So I think anything we can do to automate those processes um, really benefit both the end customer but also the people who do the jobs. I think a care job becomes a lot more attractive if you remove all the bureaucracy and just say to people, it's just about interacting with people and making friends. Absolutely. Even uh, uh, from the retail perspective, you see the industry, how they are taking AI is basically replacing all those mundane or uh, routine tasks. Instead of that, people can contribute to the more productive tasks. And all the basic ta basic information, basic data set which is required is enabled by AI. And, and the human intervention is there to basically analyze those, those inputs which is coming from through the AI or the new technology which is coming in and take some decisions to improvise the business, improvise the experience of customer in the journey. Instead of replacing those human force which is right now in that. What about the energy sector, Rob? I mean, there must be, uh, in, you know, in, energy and utilities must be ripe for automation. Yeah, there is. Um, I, I can't really talk about utilities so much, but certainly the energy sector, I think, because it's been driven by another area, I think all the, there's the industrial challenge statements that get through through the catapults, et cetera, and industry challenges. So there's always these questions that need to be answered. Um, Everyone's got time, you know, they don't have time in the day to do the job. So AI is filling that gap where, you know, as we said here, the mundane is being performed by AI. 
but then there's still people on the ground that are reviewing this and carry it forward. So it's saving time. It's actually working smarter. It has the overall cost. It, just, it drives costs down. So we can see wins now is on the cheapest form of electric generation in, in the UK because yeah. of it, this AI is having a direct consequence and knock-on effect of that. What about IBM? I mean, IBM must be stuffed full of uh, <laughs> computers, but also um, roles which you know, are potentially going to be disrupted themselves and automated out over time, or, or do you not see that? Um, not really, no, because we've, we're moving more towards a sort of service economy where it's delivering higher value services to our clients. And um, we do do a lot of what we call digital process automation, where we take manual processes and or it's other digital robotic process automation, which doesn't mean a, a robot like that, but you get a piece of software that can log into your website and click buttons and type in fields and stuff. Um, we've done an awful lot of that over the last decade or so to streamline processes and to take, take the rough edges off the processes. But um, I, I don't think it's uh, still a long way to go, but um, it's, we, we're using it in sort of higher level functions. So one of the things we've introduced recently is um, we have this online learning university within IBM where we go and do online training for different things and different skills and new programming languages and learning about cloud and AI, all, all the things you need to learn about. And we've now got a thing which kind of recommends for you based on what you've learned before and what it knows about your job role and what you tell it you need to know about in the future. It predicts a sort of learning curriculum for you for the modules you should do, which you could do for yourself, but it, it saves you hunting through the catalog and it, it suggests the things which might not be so obvious based on it looking through the curriculum rather than just the title of the course. So that's proven very useful. And what about a big, you know, a big financial services, a big insurance company like Viva? I mean, which parts of that industry are, change, uh, are, it, are AI disrupting most rapidly? Um, look, it's it, all of it. Essentially all of it. Um, if you look at in the 1980s when insurance first started to go direct and online, it was pretty cumbersome, pretty ugly. People took a quote form and stuck it on the internet and you fill it out. Um, if you look now, 92, 93% of the quotes we do are online, via a smartphone, um, via a tablet, whatever it happens to be. But it's not done in the same way as it used to be. AI... Um, you know, being able to read documents, so I mentioned reading GP reports, getting a process that took four days down to two seconds, um, making it faster and making it easier. And actually, you know, if you, you look at the new product we just launched on TV, you can see our ad, Eva Plus it's called, it's great. Um, but it's actually got 200 different data science modules and components sitting within it and behind it. Um, and we had a whole raft of effort to do that. And it really means that things are easier and faster and actually, you know, you, you, you get all sorts of great things that sit in there. Um, but when I look at it, I just see a load of data science. And it's, it's great to see that it is actually really changing the industry we, we work in. So, you know, we're perhaps seeing, you know, real unprecedented change, especially we've moved towards the right of um, Andy, Andy's diagram. I mean, what does history tell us about kind of attitudes to technology disruption? And, yeah. you know, what can we learn from the past about how to make the most of this? Well, I think there's always been an anxiety about new technologies. So if we go back to our very first industrial revolution, people knew it was changing. They didn't have the word technology they were using. They didn't call it an industrial revolution, but they knew things were changing, and there was always an anxiety about the changes that go with that. There wasn't very much anxiety at that time about the loss of jobs, because it was the feeling that the jobs people had been doing were very, I mean, uh, spinning cotton. I mean, it was very low status work, very time consuming, very boring. It was done by women. women. Nobody cared that this was being automated and turned into a good professional job in a, and the women were losing their jobs and it was not part of the debate or part of the discourse at all. So there's definitely always this anxiety. I think the, the big shift with industrialization, which we've never, I and mean, there have been kind of successive waves of new technology, and you know, in the early 20th century, Maynard Keynes is saying, well, we're all going to work, was it a 14 hour week or something, because the technology and the machines are going to do jobs for us, but and it's never happened, it's never come to pass. Um, and ever since the first industrial revolution, we've always worked more and much more intensively 
than we did in pre-industrial <coughs> societies, and it's true of pre-industrial societies today. Pre-industrial societies never work at full capacity because most people are farming, and you don't need to work hard all year round when you're farming, and sometimes it's raining and you can't do it anyway. Um, so you've got a lot of underemployed people, and we've had much, much fuller kind of rates of activity and of employment since then. Um, and every new wave of um, technology, there's this thought there will be, we'll have more time for leisure, and we will have unemployment, or however it's framed, and we never seem to enter into that world either. And I think my own um, sphere of um, academia is quite an interesting um, example. Back in the 1970s and the 1980s, historians and academics didn't do very much record keeping and administration because there wasn't any computing, so there was no way of keeping these records and there was no purpose for it. So mostly they were just doing the teaching, doing the research, and that was that. And then since the advent of personal computers, it now becomes possible for everybody to do their record keeping and to email people and to do lots of things themselves that were passed out to a secretary to do previously. Um, and so now we spend a lot more of our life actually doing the administration than we did before the technology. And it's quite interesting to hear people around the table say, well, we'll be freer to get on and do the really interesting things with the technology. Um, and it hasn't really, it hasn't kind of come to pass across the whole of the economy, this the idea that technology will free us up to do the really interesting things. Very often the technology means that we now spend more time doing quite boring things that have been enabled by the technology. So, um, the World Economic Forum has uh, put out this statistic that for kids entering primary school this year, by the time they hit the workplace, 65% um, of the jobs that we're doing haven't been invented yet. Um, and we've Andy talked about augmented intelligence as a human plus machine. So, I mean, what are the new skills that we need to be teaching our kids? school, the role of universities and businesses in terms of developing these kind of hybrid skills that are going to enable us as human beings and as professionals to get the most out of machines. I mean, do those skills exist yet or are they, are they emerging? Um, and you talked about the um, online learning university. I mean, is this the kind of thing that you're considering within IBM? Yeah, I mean, this is very much what we're sort of thinking about now is what are the skills we're going to need in the next five years, not, not the next 20 years, but just the five years to, um, to help support our clients then with what's emerging in technology. And uh, the, the main things that I'm seeing um, are data science skills. So being able to take data sets and make sense of them, be able to know how to visualize them, understand the statistical terms, not be bamboozled by significant tests and things like that, um, to, uh, not to be, have the, the wool pulled over your eyes easily by sort of data analytics and, uh, analytics and statistics being thrown at you. Um, and I think also this whole thing about bias in AI is to have a healthy skepticism about the answer that a computer is telling you uh, until you've got some way of convincing yourself that it is actually re right, sort of validating that it is correct. Uh, those are the two main areas I'm seeing at the moment. In terms of what I teach children to do, actually, it's an interesting debate because uh, at my wife's school, they don't allow children to use their mobile phones in the classroom because they just end up WhatsApping each other. But actually, what they should be teaching is teaching children how to find out information. So rather than having to remember the answer to what's the longest river in the world, you should be able to tell them, be teaching them how to look up what's the longest river in the world and to not accept the first hit on Google as the correct result, as a lot of children do believe. <laughs> uh, they, did a survey, they did a survey, that is what most people believe, um, um, to be critical about those results and find the correct answer, because you, know, you don't, in their future, as you say, they won't need to remember what the longest river in the world is. They'll just need to know how to look it up and how to trust the answer they've got back. So that's very much something which I know more, I know some schools do allow that and do encourage that and do actually teach that, but still an awful lot of schools are not teaching those rather fundamental skills. Uh, I mean, from in, a humanity, in a humanities department, do you, do you need more data scientists? I think, I mean, very, I mean just like speaking as a historian, particularly of the Industrial Revolution, I think one thing that's really always a surprise and really interesting is because that all happens, we industrialise on a, with a workforce that's not educated to any, in, in any meaningful way. I mean, schooling isn't compulsory. 
you know, by the 19th century, you know, we're 1870, 1880 before schooling is compulsory, and then only until the age of 10. So we're on the, you know, the verge of the 20th century, and most people have only got a few years of schooling, and yet we're still the biggest economy in the world. And part of what we see when we actually look at, or when you look closely at what's going on in these, um, these, these people's lives is that work is the education. That, that you, we have a model today that we, we prepare everybody up until the age of 21, which is historically a very late age of entering the workforce. Um, and then they go, and then they're ready to work. Well, in my period, people are starting paid work much, much earlier. Um, and obviously, for some, it's just a dead-end job and doesn't go anywhere. But there's lots of capacity to train on the job. And when you hear those kinds of statistics um, about you know, the larger proportion of children being in jobs that we don't even know exist... I mean, how does a university, you know, prepare for a world in which um, we don't even know what the jobs are? So I think we, we, you know, we have to carry on what we're doing, which is teaching critical skills. Um, but I think also maybe, you know, as a society, think a little bit more about the balance between education, work, and learning, which are very kind of bifur bifurcated in our system, where you educate in a closed environment like a university until a certain age then you go out to work and the, the bringing together of these different spheres may be a kind of a model for us in the future. Of course the apprenticeship schemes are a good reflection of that uh, coming back where people are doing more vocational learning on the job um, in whatever sphere it is. It isn't just manual labour when we have loads of apprentices in IBM learning uh, amazing IT skills doing it far better than some of our graduates actually. Yeah, That's we, story. We, <laughs> we, we think about this perhaps slightly differently so we, we, we view it as we're not here to develop really deep, new, technical, academic things. That is for academia. Um, we do have some very, very deep technical people. A lot of our people are exploratory and entrepreneurial in their mindset. And I think when I'm looking for data science folks and mathematicians and computer scientists, yes, you have to have a reasonable <coughs> grounding in those sorts of things. Not just those things, but broad set of numerate skills. Um, the mindset is really, really important. And I think that ability to think laterally and consider a problem, those things are almost timeless. Um, you put them together with those understanding of, of, of some of those new techniques and, and, and mathematics and computer science, and you've got a winning ticket. Uh, so I think for us, uh, water industry is quite risk averse uh, for obvious reasons. We don't really want to poison you all um, next time we have a drink of water. Um, <laughs> but so it's balancing that kind of that potential for innovation with the risks that it can bring with it and understanding where that sweet spot is. Because as a result of being quite risk averse, it means actually in a lot of areas, we're actually quite behind the curve in actually what we're doing with different technologies, not just AI. So there, there are very good reasons to be risk averse, but it's how do you push that and how do you, um, people coming into the industry get that balance right? And I would say that the industry hasn't got that balance right and we're now innovating more and there's a big drive to innovate and to, to use these new technologies that are coming through for a variety of different things. But yeah, I think it's, it's that technology isn't always the answer and it's not always the best thing and, and being able to understand that that sweet spot is where I think some of the education needs to come through. And actually, to be honest, and that brings, it means bringing in the humanities. It means kind of looking at how we interact with people, how we interact with technology, and not the technology for technology's sake type piece that can sometimes come through. I agree. Yeah. Because technologies keep changing, and you, you can't just build your courses or curriculum on some, some technologies because every, the, the, the base technology is changing right now. You can't go ahead, but you need to build the right mindset for the kids to come so that they, get, they can upskill, they are open to learn new things, and they can, they can transform. Because jobs are it's transforming, it's not evaporating, it's transforming from one way to, uh, to other skill. The, the academics, which we need to focus more on the logical thinking and the right mindset, right attitude of the kids, so that they can, when, when the technologies are changing, they can adapt those uh, changes, they can adapt those technologies and grow in those directions. Um. Ben gave a really good example of, um, a practical example of how AI is um, kind of reducing sort of barriers to entry. The residents in care homes. I mean, what are the other kind of blockers to AI adoption? What can, you know, business people, what can governments do to sort of 
remove those barriers? I think one area is um, the dispelling the fear, fear that could take over from us. You know, the, the machines are coming and they'll take all our jobs away and they'll kill us all and they'll poison the water. And <laughs> things. Um, the more we see things like, you know, we keep picking on the internet, but there's a good example of something which is relatively benign <laughs> uh, on average, on mostly, um, uh, which is helpful. And people, and um, so I spent the last. 20 years working the Internet of Things, and it used to be called pervasive computing. The reason it was called pervasive computing was when it's successful, you don't even know it's there. It's just disappeared into the fa fabric of things around you. And so it is with AI. I mean, people will have a little machine learning algorithm in their toaster, which turns out particularly good toast, regardless of how much you play with the little knob, um, because it's been trained on a whole set of, sort of different toast gradients. Uh, and it does it much better. Your car will have any any amount of you know, in the machine. The um, the energy management unit will have a little machine learning algorithm that's been trained in the factory and now plays out which gear should you be in <coughs> according to the revs and the speed. That kind of that table has been found sort of experimentally. Um, so we're finding little examples of it all around us all the time. And the more we, they just kind of become part of our lives. The more we'll sort of subconsciously accept AI, and it won't be the big AI, big, big air quotes, to be part of that spectrum of analytics, machine learning, big data science, things that just make our lives easier. We've, we've observed that, that trend for simplicity, and it's one way. So generally, once we've all done something that's really simple, yeah, you, you, you do it once, there's a really, really high bar to go back and do the same thing in a complicated way. <laughs> So once, you, once it's got simpler, I think, and I'd be interested to get a historical perspective on this, but I think we're all inherently quite lazy. And once we've done something that's really simple, the prospect of having to take away the AI that's made it really simple is just, is just not, it's not going to happen. So when I describe uh, simplicity, I describe it as a bit like water. We just flow to simplicity. And I think... Yes, there are all sorts of things you have to think around around ethics and the way AI works. And there's, there's clearly that, that needs consideration. But... I think we love simplicity, and we observe it in the data as well, that actually once someone's done a three-question quote, getting them to go back to do 102 is just, they're, they're not going to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, just to say, I think um, it, it, it's always unstoppable, and we don't see societies moving back to older technologies. We just don't. We just don't. Um, nobody wants, once the spinning, you know, the spinning jenny had been invented, nobody wanted to go back and use the wheel. I mean, a lot of people do use them, so a lot of people are very slow to move from one to the other. Um, but little by little, everybody moves on to the quicker and the easier technology, and they don't go back. Yeah. Do you think there's a risk, though, if you go too far down that route? And I think it's, it's, it's interesting what Andy was saying about the interplay of ethics and data. I don't know whether having an AI um, judging whether another AI is doing things right is necessarily the right direction, <laughs> so who watches the watchman. But um, I think um, when you look back at something like the seatbelt or the, the development of the seatbelt in the 60s, um, that was largely engineered by um, men. Crash dummies were male, and they mm. were the same size and weight as men. And what you found is um, overwhelmingly women and children were dying in car crashes because it was built around that model. And I think the same thing's true of algorithms, you look at Silicon Valley and it's overwhelmingly male, um, I think those biases unconsciously creep into algorithms. And I think there needs to be an industry around keeping those algorithms in check and, and making sure that they're getting out of hand. There was also an interesting um, element to seatbelts. So people talk about autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles have been happening, for, effectively they've been safer for decades. Um, people actually drove faster when you gave them a seatbelt. Yeah. Um, it had an interesting effect on the accidents and, and the, the things that you observed. Um, but actually, my suspicion is if you had a, um, you put things like autonomous emergency braking in vehicles now, which will stop a car at 20 miles an hour, if you put that in every white van in the country, are people going to suddenly start driving slower? And no, I suspect they'll actually drive faster. Um, so I think how the technology gets applied is actually going to be really interesting to observe. Um, and how people utilise it. And it, it might go in ways that you don't instinctively expect. That's happened with ABS brakes as well. The biggest thing that increased the road speed um, on things like motorways was the availability of ABS brakes to be able to stop again. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, 
it will, that, that will be a really ap interesting yeah. application of technology. And I think, actually, again, that's where the social sciences come in, because <coughs> looking through that whole um, pathway of what was happening, why they were being put in, and what the, the likely reaction was, is not something I suspect was thought about when they put in ABS brakes. It was a nice technological solution Absolutely. to... It wasn't a solution, was it? It was a. It, it was something that was there to to stop the impacts of the problem, not the problem itself. And I, you know, think there is scope for bringing in those other disciplines. Um, I think the unintended consequence is really the, you know, is what yeah, we've, exactly. we've just. Yeah. That's what happens every time <coughs> you. I mean, I think for you know the, the the personal computer is the classic example of the unintended consequence. It was supposed to free us up from administration, but in fact, it's turned us all into administrators. Um, and I'm sure we do much more administration as a workforce than we did before the computers were there. Um, you know, we unintended consequence. I, mean, I think from from a historic you know historical perspective, that's really what you see over and over again. And some lovely examples have already been kind of shared with us today. We're actually finding sometimes actually government legislation that is holding this back, especially for the, the Indeed commissioning or even um, remote dr uh, drone operations. <coughs> that so you have to have the drone line of sight. Why can't you be based on shore and have your drone flying you know, 30 miles away, working from a control centre? So that's that's the thing. We kind of got this innovation there. People want to use it, but it's really being held back by the government legislation. So they want to be a little bit freer, but you know. You know what the government's like at the minute, so perhaps that won't happen so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm alluding to. Maybe it'll all be it sorted out tomorrow, you never know. Probably yeah. um, <laughs> to build something to sort it out by the looks of it. Yeah. So, um, so my last question before we move really into the, uh, and open it up to the audience is, um, no, is, is what, what would you like to see next? So Andy's talked about you know, the majority of AI is yet to come. Um, but what would you? What would be most helpful? What would you most like to see in your industry, in your business, uh, in terms of a new thing, from a, you know, a new new capability of AI? Whether it's something that's being inhibited actually by legislation, or it's just that the technology is there, or that the culture is not there. I'll talk quickly. Really. I, I think from I speak to a lot of people, especially. Um, offshore wind farm operators, and they're collecting huge amounts of data, um, vast amounts, um, and they're only using a fraction of it. The rest of it just literally sometimes just sits in the cupboard. Um, for me, there has to be some kind of element forward where they're looking at the, this large data, the analytics, and they're coming up with a, a predictive uh, maintenance regime as opposed to reactive maintenance. Yeah. That would be the biggest saving. They, they've got all this, where parts, parts are about to fail, are failing, then the consequence of them failing, and then you tie that into not just an individual turbine, but looking at an entire asset, so an entire wind farm, at what point it become critical to go out and say service four or five turbines as opposed to just hitting one at a time, far yeah. more cost effective. So for me, I think that, that would be the big step change in offshore wind. I know it's there, I know it's happening slightly, but again, it comes back to them knowing about the, you know, the, uh, the, the supercomputers where they can actually start processing these large data sources. Yeah. I mean, Andy, you've got access to some of the world's <laughs> most kind of cutting edge and powerful technology, but are there still things that can't do that you'd love to be able to do? Yeah, I think, I think this, despite what we've shown with things like Watson winning Jeopardy, there's still an awful lot of that to be done in terms of the understanding of unstructured data, in, in particular in text. I mean, it's, it's, it is really quite rudimentary what it does, even though it appears quite clever. I think to be able to understand nuances of meaning, like sarcasm, for example, um, in, in written text, and use that to link together different sources of unstructured data just to be able to reason about the world around us. That, that's the thing I see is missing at the moment, is that, that it's rather like you, a small child, um, as, you, as it grows, it experiences the world around it, and then can know that you know, dogs bite and uh, apples are green and you know, all these different things. But until you, it learns those things from experience, it has no way of knowing them. So it's really finding a way of giving at the AI world context so that it doesn't make blunderous errors, and so it, it can be more helpful to us. Yeah. Uh, considering see where the future of AI lies, uh, what my opinion that uh, right now where we are, we are uh, the AI needs a lot of data to feed in, and that depends on the type of data what we are feeding in, we are getting the result out of it, like the Andy cover that the good AI and the bad AI, how the interpretation happens. Now the future what we see in where AI or the algorithm understands and there goes into a self-learning mode instead of what we feed in and the output comes out from the, out of that. Instead of they, they know what they have to learn it, 
they, they figure out from the, the, that thing, uh, the interpretation from that, and then give some suggestive indications or the ideas to work upon. They should not take that, or you can say going towards from the AI to NI, the natural intelligence. That is the way which I can see 4C which is going to come in future. Mm, interesting. I think for us it's about joined up working. So um, there's great information that's being collected in adult social care. There's also great information that's being collected in clinical settings um, in the NHS. But at the moment, those data sit in silos and they don't interact with each other. So I think from our perspective, the real breakthroughs in predictive <coughs> analytics and being able to predict medical issues before they happen um, sits in joining those two data sets up and linking cause at an adult social care perspective and effect in a clinical setting um, to do some really interesting analysis. Um, we've been talking about partnership working between adult social care and the NHS for a long, long time, but I think that is something that will hold back um, any real breakthroughs in terms of predictive analytics. Well, I mean, I think, obviously, uh, I don't think there are going to be many people in the room who've come from humanities, depart you know, humanities departments in, in the university to, to listen tonight. And I think that's, that tells its own tale in that we don't feel that AI is awfully relevant to what we do um, and that the great bulk of what we do uh, is very difficult at present to imagine. I've given a specific example of the computer learning on large sets of historical records, which is you know, a niche part of my research. Um, but in the, the bulk of what we do, it's very hard to see how or where AI is going to intervene and how it's going to make us do something different in our day-to-day -day working. I think what, 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 his, what, what academics want is to be free of administration. Um, but actually, when we think of all the administration that we do, that's all mandated by human beings somewhere else in the organisation. And very often, we're beyond the organisation in the government as well. So they're really human decisions that are driving us to do the things that we have to do. And it doesn't seem that there's a computer solution or an AI solution to those problems. Um, so I think it's, it's quite... Um, it's very interesting to be in a room with people who will probably all have a vision of what AI can do for them and to say, actually, in my job... Um, and in my colleagues, my colleagues aren't here tonight, nor are my students. And it doesn't feel relevant to us at the moment. Yeah. Um, look, so insurance for years has been about basically paying when something goes horribly wrong. And, you know, <laughs> you, you, you see some of them and some, some of the claims are sort of, oh, I, I've lost something or something's happened and it's broken a material thing. And some of them are pretty shocking. Um, it'd be a surprise to a lot of people. We've had motor insurance claims that go for £5 million and you read the medical reports and there's an awful lot of long-term care involved when you start talking about that sort of level of spend. We get all kinds of things, uh, houses burning down and, you know, there is a raft of work I, we are starting to do and the more we can do the better, which talks about prevention. It would be much better if we didn't have to pay that money and that thing didn't have to happen to that person. So just teeny examples like um, batteries in smoke alarms that actually are connected so if it goes off, it tells lots of people that this smoke alarm has gone off. That has materially saved people's lives. So we've had examples of connected cameras in homes picking up burglars and reporting it. The ability to detect from devices that perhaps someone's health is changing. The ability to look at working patterns and see when people are actually changing how they're working in perhaps an unhealthy way. So from, from my perspective, I think the real next generation will be working t with AI to actually stop some of the bad stuff happening before it happens, because we don't really want to write a check if you, that, that's really, in some cases, not going to help. It's going to help, but it's not re it would be much better for the thing not to have happened. That's what I'm hoping for. So I think um, it kind of picks up on a lot of what's been said. Yeah, understanding what's going to happen before it happens so you can prevent it happening. Um, and understanding how that helps us deliver a better service um, to customers because effectively that's what we're all about. Um, and, and potentially we have a lot of data. We've been collecting data for a lot of years and a lot of it is, you know, paper um, and we don't know what that data can do. And I think that comes back to understanding quite what that data that's held in different bits of the business, collected for different purposes, um, monitoring different things, you know, all the way through a catchment. So everything that's, you know, out in the field, nitrate phosphate monitoring, going into a river, how it hits our water treatment works, what happens to it when it goes into a sewage works. Managing that as a system rather than as a collection of individual parts, I think, is where we'll get a lot of value. 
Right. You've been busy on Slido. Thank you very much. Um, we are now going to just uh, take a few, because uh, we've got about 20 minutes. Um, and uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks to your voting activity, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go with the, most, with, the, with, the, with the sort of most popular question. So um, I think this is a question about sort of buzzwords and marketing. So AI is increasingly being used as a marketing tool by companies not actually utilizing AI. Do we know any, do we know any of those? Um, so do you consider this a threat um, uh, to the kind of, to the progression of AI, sort of the false AI and, and mis-selling mis or false selling of AI as a, as a technology? Yeah, I think it's, um, it risks two things. One is the, that spectrum of things I talked about from statistics through digital twin through simple well, complicated analytics and data science, all those things contribute to what's loosely termed AI. I think the example you gave, by the way, about um, the optimal positioning of uh, uh, repair crews during the beach in the east, I suspect that might not have been machine learning. It might have been a op multidimensional optimizational problem, but um, why not call it AI? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not picking on you, but no, no, that's a good thing. Is thanks. there a bit of jargon in here as well, actually, you know, for a non-expert, that, you know, is it not all the same thing? Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> so it's a really interesting thing that somebody said to me once, said, uh, what's the difference between machine learning and AI? And it was, uh, if you're trying to get venture capital, it's AI. <laughs> if you're trying to hire the software developers, it's machine learning. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I think, uh, I think so many things get lumped together as AI. And uh, at one level, that's OK, because it's like the machines doing complex analytics on data. But if you just called it advanced statistics instead of AI, you wouldn't get the you wouldn't get the funding, you wouldn't get it through your boards at work, you wouldn't because you know, AI is it's exciting. It's like blockchain, really. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> Any other thoughts about the sort of yeah? I mean, I, I, Viva I, must invest well, a lot in this area. Look, I, I think we've got a session with our board, one of our boards, lots of boards, one of our boards next week, literally on that topic, um, which is showing some of the examples of the work we're doing, but actually demystifying some of these words, because they're, 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 they're frankly, I think, almost made to sound deliberately complicated. Yep. Um, you know, and, and particularly some of the new data science ones, things like entropy and cross-entropy. I mean, what, what's that? It's that model error, isn't it, broadly? And, and, and the, 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 the randomness that's left in the system after you've got the perfect model. It, it, I, think, I, I think it's deliberately made to be complicated. And for people in the humanities, for example, deliberately, almost deliberately unapproachable, I think that's got to stop. Because actually, it's quite accessible, some of this stuff. So... Um, Here's an interesting question. Now, what's the panel's view on the, on the kind of moral boundaries of using AI? You know, in what scenarios <laughs> should it not be used? Or where, where are the question marks about you know, the appropriateness? Or can it be used in any, 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 any situation where human beings can't make the decisions? Well, Welcome. I, th I think my perspective is about transparency. I think it's all about being transparent with your customer about what you're using their data for and how you're processing it. I think a lot of the time um, in, in the current age, um, algorithms have been built in secrecy and people aren't aware how decisions are being made about them. So you might go to a bank appointment, they type in some data and it spits out an answer for them. You don't really understand what data it's using to make that decision about you. So I think from my perspective, it's about being transparent about how they've arrived at that decision, how they're making those decisions, and which decisions are automated and which ones are being made by a human. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing I was going to say was um, accountability. So if you're using an AI and it makes the wrong decision, and maybe let's say somebody dies as a consequence, who's responsible? Is it you, because you own the AI? Was it the person who wrote the AI? Was it the company that sold it to you? You know, there's a whole bunch of ifs, and there's no obvious answer or, or no single answer to that question. And if it's, it's the, the classic one is self self driving cars. You know, if a software bug, or actually the uh, the uh, Airbus thing recently, you know, Boeing must be absolutely crapping themselves at the moment. <laughs> like, who's going to get sued for this? Um, was it pilot error? Mm, was it the software error? Was it the guy who wrote the code? Was it the people at the testing agents if not testing it enough? You know, this is really tricky. Ethical, moral, philosophical grounds. 
So what uh, Ben covered and Andy covered nicely. So in terms of transparency and accountability is important. Plus, uh, we also need to need to have a strong uh, system or the, the guidelines from the treasury bodies because sometimes customer is not aware of even if what he is getting it. The alerts. Are, I can give you a typical example when you are downloading any app on your mobile. It will ask you certain conditions. Nobody read that conditions because nobody can't understand those conditions. And they simply said yes. So for those things where you are saying yes and you are passing your information, you are not, you're not aware of what you're passing on. Yeah. We, need a, we need strong guidelines from the statutory bodies to control those things. Whatever is personal, we need to stop it there. So we need, we need to know where the boundary starts for the personal things and to the things which you can share publicly. Okay. That's a good example of that. I read the terms and conditions from my bank recently just because I felt like reading them. Just, it does for me. Anyway, by the, time right. I, by the time I'd actually read them and got to the bottom, it had timed me out and logged me out for inactivity. Yeah. <laughs> so I they obviously gonna, didn't expect gonna, you to read them. I was going to raise that example because you can actually time now with any digital analytics how long people spend on various parts of a web page and you can see how many people are reading terms and conditions. And Google has a speed reader so you can see how long it takes to read some of these things. Um, it wasn't one of ours, but it was, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a website that we were quite a, working quite closely with. And uh, this thing took 26 minutes to read at a fast speed, and the website timed out after 20 minutes. Yeah. So no one had ever read this document. And, and I think, so when we did a lot of customer research around our, we created a new customer data chart to try and talk to customers about how, how we use their data. And we thought control and transparency would come out really strongly, and it, it sort of did. But actually, a lot of customers said, we expect you to behave ethically. What we actually care about is you've got to keep our data safe, yeah? We don't want you to sell our data. And actually, the third one really surprised us. It was, tell us what's in it for us. Mm -hmm. So they actually said, look, we expect you to, you know, to act in an ethical way. We've given you the data, but we don't want you to give it to anyone else. We want you to keep it safe and then actually start to tell us about the benefits. Because we thought the third, we always three things as much as most people think me can remember. So we thought we'd keep it to three. Um, and that third one was the surprise. It actually came out as, we don't mind you using it, but just tell us what's in it, what the, what, what's in it for me. Um, so it's interesting. And I think that's something that's only going to increase. I think people are becoming more and more aware of the value of their data. I think yeah. um, not too long ago, people were quite happy to trade as much data as possible for a free service like Facebook. But I think people are slowly becoming more and more aware of, of the true value of that. And like you say, wanting to understand what the benefit is to them. Yeah. Um, so there were kind of, kind of a cluster of two or three questions, which were kind of really about, about decision making and um, sense of topical. Uh, topical themes emerge, you know, can we use AI in politics? No. We, uh, uh, Andy gave the example, um, you know, I, I, IBM helping an oncologist to enhance diagnosis and treatability. But, you know, in, for, in, for example, in, in our eight indicative questions, uh, in, indicative votes from last night, could an AI be unleashed on those in a helpful way? Are there, uh, and, and, and perhaps even more to actually make the decision in the, in, in, in the end? Uh, Yes. Can we see? So, I mean, are the countries AI where AI is unleashed? Been, AI is unleashed. Go on to Odds Checker. See what the results. You will watch the odds move in real time of different parts of that vote changing. And there are an army of algorithms and people doing that work. So you, they, they will you go, go on now. It's something like know, 11 to 4 or whatever, and various different. But there, there, there's, there's a, there's, that will happen. Um, you probably just let them make the decision ultimately. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to know what's going on in a referendum or uh, an election, it's much better to look at the th those algorithms in my head than to look at the polls. It's interesting. There was a tweet that went out last night after the, the, the all those votes were inconclusive. It said it reminded them of that sequence in war games where it plays out, or it's about to launch the nuclear bombs, but it actually ends up playing chess against itself a whole lot of times and actually realizes that in the end, the best thing is not to play. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't have even thought about leaving in the first place. <laughs> so, this is really a question for everyone in the room. I mean, based on this evening's discussion and what we've learned, I mean, who feels more optimistic about AI than they did? when they arrived this evening. Just a show of hands. 
And who feels less optimistic, more fearful, more pessimistic? Well, I mean, the qu one question I did, did, didn't ask was, uh, was to Andy, does Andy uh, dream and have nightmares about robots taking over the world? Um, <laughs> but it sounds like most of us are feeling empowered by AI, and I think that's uh, the point. A human-computer partnership. Uh, I, I, we love that. So um, thank you uh, to Andy and the panel. Um, we're almost done with the formal proceedings. But I, I'd just like to thank Ira again. Uh, as the sponsor and supporter for this evening. I mean, I've been involved in the ERA project for over the last year or so as it was getting set up. And I'm personally very enthusiastic about uh, the opportunity of kind of building a bridge between business and academia. And every time I come to UEA, I meet uh, more of the faculty, more of the research staff, more, um, and more students. And, and there are, you know, real huge resources here, but ERA links up multiple universities across this magnificent geography of ours. And uh, if you are interested in tapping into expertise at low cost and uh, very easily in AI, in biotechnology, which is a particular focus here, in digital creative, uh, come and talk to the ERA team. There will be people around. Um, I think there are some leaflets uh, 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 which um, uh, we will, you will be able to find out in the foyer. Um, so thank you, uh, and find out how ERA can help you. Um, very uh, prosaic thing. I'm sure that AI will have a solution to this uh, next time we do one of these events. But uh, if you haven't already done so, please remember to validate your yellow parking tokens from the car park before you leave so you can get out free. Although uh, I'm told that the barrier may be up anyway. This is a gig. So um, there are more refreshments available in the foyer. You'd be pleased to know. Uh, and I hope you can, uh, some of you can, 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 can stay on now uh, to continue the conversation outside. But please join me in giving Andy Stanford and our panel a round of applause. <laughs>